Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Thinking with Kaifu Lee. My name is James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And one of the things that we've been trying to do in the two years or so since we launched Tortoise was understand the forces driving the news, not breaking news. And perhaps there's no greater one, notwithstanding the conversations about the planet, notwithstanding the conversations about changes to health in the context of the pandemic. Perhaps there's no greater one than that's happening in technology and in particular as regards AI. Um, if you're interested in AI, there's really no point in introducing Kaifu Lee because you know perfectly well who he is. But nonetheless, Kaifu, I'm going to do that embarrassing thing, which is just introduce you because A, you've worked everywhere that you really need to work Apple, Microsoft, Google, now in innovation and investment in AI and internet opportunities in China. Um, but also, you're probably one of the few people who can understand the details of AI technologies and the geopolitics and the social impacts of it. And obviously your AI superpowers book was one that made people rethink the geopolitics of tech. And now AI 2041, I think, is really making people rethink the relationship between government, science and citizen what we can look forward to and what we need to worry about. And that's the nature of the conversation we want to have. I know you haven't done a think in with us, although you have, thank you, been a member of our advisory board on the AI index, on Tortoise's AI index. So thank you for that. But in this conversation, what happens is we try to bring in as many people as possible. So I might kick off with a few sort of questions and thoughts, but in the course of this hour, we'd love to get an understanding of how AI is, impacting all of us, our world and us individually. Um, but I'm gonna try and make sure that we hear from as many people as possible. The aim is that as a general rule, we don't really want questions, we want people's thoughts, we want you to engage in different points of view. So we hope we'll hear from as many people as possible. And I should say before we get going, Kaifu, I looked at your <coughs> Twitter feed and I saw the, the new hot pot robot um, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> um what it, the, the robot looked very impressive what i couldn't tell was how good was the hot pot oh it's extraordinary because uh, uh the chinese care a great deal about the food so yeah. in the hot pot there are specific rules about certain types of meat you have to be exactly 90 seconds others you need to go down eight times and up seven times so the robot does exactly what is needed to get the perfect uh uh, degree of cookedness for the for the food. The, the, the robot needs to what dunk the meat. So yeah, there's one type of meat that needs to be dunk uh, down uh, down eight times, up seven times. Then it's perfect for eating. <clears throat> well, so so I lived in Shanghai for a while, and my friends in Shanghai, particularly those ones from Chongqing or from Sichuan, would say that you couldn't really have a proper hot pot in Shanghai. You needed to go to Chongqing or Chengdu, but particularly Chongqing and sit in these incredibly hot rooms where as the food got hotter, the food got hotter yeah. people got increasingly, you know, the buttons on the shirts got lower, the trousers got rolled up. I didn't know whether or not, how hot was the hot pot? Uh, well, we were in Beijing, so we did not do hot pot. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, well, listen, I, I want to, I, I hope in the course of this conversation, we, we'll take head on some of the fears and also understand some of the direction of AI. But I wanted to start with a simple question. I remember hearing from um, Bill Gates about his subject of study when he was at university before he dropped out of university, which was on around was all around computer recognition. And your PhD thesis, his was around visual recognition. Your PhD thesis, of course, was about speech recognition and. And I wondered whether, knowing what you know now, if you went back to Columbia or to Carnegie Mellon and said, right, I'm gonna do a PhD thesis now, mm -hmm. what would be the subject that you would choose to focus on? Uh, actually, at uh, undergraduate Columbia, I worked on natural language and computer vision. So, uh, and then at graduate school, I did speech recognition because I thought that was a lower hanging fruit and that turned out to be right. Uh, of course, what I think what I missed out in the graduate years was that Jeff Hinton was uh, right across the uh, hallway, and I did not choose him as an advisor. 
um, <laughs> but that 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 was regrettable. Uh, he was one on uh, he was on one of my thesis committee and did give me excellent feedback though. But what your book today? I suppose what I'm really wondering is, you know, 25 years ago, most of us didn't think that there was much speech recognition. Today, if you were doing a future-facing PhD, what would be the subject that you would focus on? Well, today I would um, uh, probably look at how um, how to leverage. I would probably look at computer architecture, actually, because uh, what is interesting in the last 10 years, 2010 to today, is that the most um, most advanced AI applications have grown seven times in compute requirement year to year. So seven times for the last 10 years. And, and you can check out this paper that describes this by OpenAI. And, what, and that is why today we're totally out of whack, right? The latest advances, GPT-3 and uh, all the new technologies are using $100 million computers or spending millions of dollars of um, cloud um, uh, compute. So I, I think we are very badly in need of a compute revolution. So, so there are two group camps of people, right? One believes it's really study of the human brain plus uh, compute. <clears throat> the other that feels compute has got a long way to go. And it's the only proven way that can, uh, can scale when you throw more data and compute at it. Well, I'm of course more on the sec la la latter camp and given that, I think the bottleneck is clearly in that we don't have enough compute and quantum computer is too far away. What are we going to do in the next 10 years? If we want to advance the state, say the art in AI, we can't just go from $100 million computer to $700 million to $5.0 billion. Uh, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to, uh, to be possible. So uh, I would probably choose to work on computer architecture that actually can scale, that gets um, uh, pseudo quantum to us um, uh, faster. And, and just tell us what the timetable is to quantum. <clears throat> well, I think about 20 years. <clears throat> that is um, approximate. That's probably the, the, the least certain thing in the book, AI 2041, is that the quantum depends on many things, you know, how to stabilize the um, the um, uh, logical qubits. There needs to be millions of logical qubits to support just 4,000 physical, uh, sorry, um, there needs to be a, over a million physical qubits just to support 4,000 logical qubits. And, and people don't really know if that's enough to manage the stability, but uh, based on a survey of the industry, checking with the experts, they are basically estimating it would be uh, uh, in the 15 year time frame. That's probably the median date where people think a 4,000 qubit quantum computer would work. And that's the point at which it would be uh, fast enough to crack, let's say, uh, uh, today's cryptography and probably begin to do some useful AI. And, and Clifford, you're going to have to go. I think we've had a few conversations like this in the past. You remember, you're going to have to go gently with me. So your, okay. your definition of quantum computing, how do you define the difference between quantum computing and what you call <clears throat> quantum? Well, quantum computing is basically using um, the principles of quantum mechanics using completely different parts that are analog, uh, that don't have bits that are zero or one, but that can really fluctuate and take on different, uh, different uh, numbers. So that allows the compute to, to go exponentially fast mm -hmm. because um, uh, and every qubit expands the capability, um, uh, essentially doubles the capability. So the, a number of qubits in a computer represents how many uh, bits of uncertainty, zero to one uncertainty can be used. So mm -hmm. if you can describe a problem of having 4,000 uh, bits that are uncertain could take on any value and you could simultaneously in one blast evaluate all the possibility and say uh, the best answer is through this path and the problem is solved then you're recast, you need to recast every problem of that of stabilizing and destabilizing and figuring out the best path in, in, in 4,000 uh, numbers, uh, analog numbers. 
-hmm. So, so the cryptography can be cast into that term. Uh, AI problems uh, can also, but that hasn't been uh, yet discovered. So, so, so Kai, I'll, I'll tell you what I'd love to do, and just so everyone knows a, a bit about the structure of the conversation we're hoping to have, but please feel free to weigh in. I'd love to do a little bit of conversation about the near future, and then this 20 year okay. horizon of the new book, AI 2041, because I suppose, you know, the AI superpowers book raised a question about the prospect of China galloping ahead in the AI race, which in 2018 seemed frankly like quite a radical worldview and something that we would wait till the back end of the 2020s to find out. And now in 2021, it, it feels like close to a settled fact. It feels, if anything, that China is already accelerating in the race with the US and, and may yet overtake it. So I just wanted to get foot to start with that, your view of where China is in that, in that, and I assume it is a contest with the US. Sure. Um, China is, um, in terms of um, uh, implementation and uh, AI-based businesses, China is ahead of the US in, uh, in robotics and the use of AI in uh, probably in the internet space as well. Uh, US is ahead of China in um, uh, enterprise computing and, uh, prob and also in uh, autonomous vehicle, although that one is uh, up for grabs. So I think we're uh, neck to neck uh, right, right now. Mm -hmm. In terms of research, I think China has more papers than the US mm -hmm. and more decent papers, but mm -hmm. not as many great papers and not nearly as many Turing Award recipient quality of papers. Mm -hmm. So one could argue US has some leadership position there. So we're basically neck and neck, whether we look at uh, some aggregate um, uh, market value or um, uh, total number of unicorns or uh, number of good papers, there is roughly neck to neck right now. And, and, and Kaifu, I suppose that in the old world, in the industrial world, I would immediately understand what those different kinds of market leadership would mean, right? So if Germany is very good at making cars and yeah. Audis and the US is very good at making Coca-Cola and consumer goods, I can understand the cultural impact. I don't really understand what the difference mm. is between, globally, between having... Okay leadership on you know uh, enterprise software and autonomous vehicles versus okay. the internet what, what's the like okay. impact of that yeah so in terms of the business impact uh china uh would have more uh robots in the manufacturing that are uh visually inspecting moving and manipulating objects and doing what um the routine work that human blue collar workers do and U.S. would have more uh, smart software in the enterprise doing things to help the knowledge worker and potentially to also displace white collar uh, routine work. And in terms of companies, uh, China would have uh, brilliant manufacturing companies that are uh, almost um, completely automated. Uh, U.S. would have amazing enterprise software and a bunch more companies like uh, you know, C3AI, and you would see Salesforce and uh, uh, um, uh, Google Cloud would become AI enabled and used by a lot more people than, uh, than Chinese software, for example. And in <laughs> autonomous vehicles, I think both China and US will have a bunch. The, the China ones may be, is currently behind, but they may push ahead if the government uh, creates enough infrastructure and incentive to um, accelerate the adoption. And Kaifu, just to take that, I'm going to hyper simplify, not just oversimplify, but a world in which China dominates the automation of manufacturing and the US dominates the automation of service industries with those mm -hmm. that, that basically, <clears throat> presumably then what you're seeing is a Chinese assault on, if you like, blue collar work, a USA assault on, on white collar work. If, it, yeah. I know that's a mass oversimplification. Yeah, yeah what, that's right. What, what though then are the implications of that within their own economies and, and in terms of the footprint of Chinese AI and US AI on the international economy? I think these will have global impact. 
because U.S. will be the dominant provider of software uh, in a new way of work. Uh, co I think one of, I mean, COVID has been terrible for the world, especially for U.S., but one of the benefits from, uh, from, for, for the U.S. is that work from home has become a new way of making work more efficient, and it's becoming digitized. And once it's digitized, AI can come in to uh, help people do their jobs better and to take over jobs that are routine. So that so US, the U.S. model, the U.S. new model of working office and home in a combined efficient way will become the new way that the whole world should work together if they want that efficiency. And that workflow enhanced by enterprise software, cloud, and AI uh, will push U.S. further into the leadership. So there will be more companies like Salesforce, uh, Einstein, and um, uh, C3 AI, et cetera. In China, I think that's a little less direct. Uh, China is already the world's factory more than any other country, but I think even more goods will be made in China. Um, and not only because the labor is, has been automated, but because uh, China will have a better supply chain, better um, experience in getting the raw materials. Uh, and also uh, China currently already has a very low cost energy uh, and, and I think that energy cost will come down lower even as the whole globally, the energy shifts to one that's combining uh, solar and distributed storage into batteries. Uh, China will be in a good position to, 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 to lead in that as well. So the net impact is more people in the world will be buying goods from China at lower costs that are sustainable only because China's um, lower cost of energy that's yeah. no longer dependent on the Middle East oil, as well as the China automation. So, so Kaifu, I'm going to come back, uh, if I might, to that environmental point, because I see that my colleague Zav Greenwood is interested in that. And, and there's, a, there's quite a conversation that you may have missed in the chat around quantum computing. But I just want to stick with the impacts of AI on work and workers for a moment. I'm going to bring in my colleague, Alexandra Musavizade, who you know, who's been the architect of our AI index, and also Alex Inch, because both of them, I suppose, are asking about the extent we should be optimistic about automation and the supplanting of labor. And the way you describe it actually is massively helpful because it sort of organizes a way of thinking about it. The question is whether or not, once we've organized and see it more clearly, we're still more, we're more, more or less worried about it. Alexandra, do you want to weigh in on the optimism point? Yes, thank you so much, James Kaifu. Such an honor to have you here with us. Great to see you again. Um, on the question of the labor market, I think when, when you were last in London, which seems like now a lifetime ago, and you were talking about the AI superpowers book, I, I was very curious to one of the points that you made there on the labor market, that you were quite an optimist when it came to, now you've actually almost answered that question in terms of how it's going to impact China and the US differently in terms of existing labor market, but you, you were talking about where it's also going to be able to create jobs. And, and I'd, I'd love you to reflect on that uh, sort of, and, and also whether you have changed your view since then in terms of where you see the jobs being created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still, I still feel long-term optimistic that we would not have a shortage of jobs. I am short-term pessimistic uh, because AI will, is, AI is designed by definition to be human work replacement. Therefore, uh, the progress of AI must lead to a replacement of, of human routine work uh, because it's much lower costs and works 24 by seven and doesn't complain, doesn't have labor unions, et cetera. So the short term, uh, the, the routine work um, displacement will happen uh, domain by domain and uh, task by task and white collar and blue collar, I think that will be a significant impact. Uh, long term, I'm positive for a couple of reasons. One is I think uh, every time human jobs have been taken away by machines, humans have always come up with new things that, that uh, exemplify uh, our new unique capabilities. And I think uh, this really pushes us away from doing the routine work but into areas of creativity, uh, areas of um, compassion, empathy, teamwork, communications, soft skills, 
uh, services sector, I think, will become big as more people have greater financial means. Uh, there will be luxury type of uh, services. Uh, people will long for human to human connection. And also as the price of goods come down, services become rarer and more valuable and more desirable. Uh, there will be an increase in wages and prices for, for example, for uh, elderly companion or for healthcare services uh, or for tour guides and concierge, et cetera. So I think that will be an increase. There will also be job, new jobs created by AI. Uh, today, we're already seeing uh, tens of millions of data labelers around the world. Of course, eventually AI will do that, but that's a temporary rise. Uh, we're also seeing you know, new jobs like robot repair, of course, AI programmers, data scientists, and we'll see many, many more that we can't even anticipate. Just like when internet started, uh, none of us could have predicted that Uber driver would become a new profession. So there will be many uh, Uber driver equivalent except enabled by AI in the 20 year time horizon. Uh, and also I think the human definition of work will change. Uh, some people will find it great to be compensated by universal basic income and decide to take on homeschooling for their children. And some people will work fewer hours uh, and maybe there will be four day work week. So there will be lots of ways we can adjust. So in the longer term, I wouldn't worry about people not having enough jobs. But in the short term, I, did, I think it is a significant issue because all the additive uh, factors will not have been in place, but the subtractive forces will uh, already be in place. Can, can, can I, can, one quick follow-up question. Is, is that okay, James? I'll yeah, just, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I, I'm, just, I'm curious about where, <clears throat> when you look back at what your, sort of where your thinking was, five, maybe eight years ago in terms of the where we would be today on AI adoption. So the use of AI across all sectors and where we are today, it seems that um, that definitely certain sectors are struggling with adopting at the pace that maybe was anticipated back five to eight years ago. So I'm wondering sort of if you're if you could maybe talk to us a bit about where those barriers to adoption in your mind lie? Is it that it's much more costly than people anticipated? Is it that it's a complete change of mindset that is needed uh, and that it just takes longer to, to implement? There's a very good example uh, of the John Deere uh, company uh, that have gone completely sort of AI first, um, mm -hmm. but that took a significant amount of effort, uh, focus, and money to do that. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Right. Uh, there are indeed barriers. I, I wouldn't say there were five to eight years ago, people were making optimistic predictions. I think the optimistic predictions maybe have come three to four years ago, really after the AlphaGo um, uh, excitement. So uh, since the three or four years ago, I think a lot of progress has been made actually on the hard problems like um, robot, robotics and uh, autonomous vehicles and natural language. So that makes me more optimistic. But there are also, as you said, barriers for adoption. I think the greatest barrier is just lack of understanding. Uh, many CEOs call me and say, I wanna use AI, but they really have no idea <laughs> what AI is. And they just think this is a magical, you know, uh, thinking, talking computer that can replace people. And I think that naivete is, is one factor. Another factor is not having the data in place. Uh, the AI today requires lots of data to function well. And if you don't have the data, the cost to accumulate the data and the cost to cleanse the data, uh, structuralize the data, label the data can be extremely costly. So some CEOs become disillusioned after spending millions of dollars to get the data in shape and, and still not ready to apply AI and they feel uh, let down. So that's another uh, factor. I, I think many of these are uh, reducing, but I, I do think um, there are uh, this, these, as well as uh, one other factor is just um, um, people, are, uh, people are afraid of losing their jobs or they're uh, non-believers or they create barriers. For example, uh, the adoption of AI in healthcare has been slow, uh, not because AI isn't beating more human physicians and surgeons and radiologists, but because the, um, the existing um, chain of um, uh, products are not willing to make way for AI. 
the AI scientists dream that give me all that data, I'll train something and plug it right into the after the MRI and I can identify all kinds of cancer better than people. But the MRI companies aren't willing, the radiology departments aren't willing because it's maybe it's not doesn't have the license, it's not proven safe, patients don't yet ask for it and maybe the radiologists are afraid of losing their jobs and the companies making the MRI machines want that business for themselves. So the, I think the friction uh, caused by resistance of the entrenched traditional industry would be another factor I would, I would list as well. Kind of just out of interest, is there an example of that, if you like, human obstructionism that you can give us? Mm -hmm. Well, lots of examples. When automobiles were first invented, uh, people um, actually in the UK came up with the, um, I think it was called the red, uh, red, red flag or red lantern law, which says if you want to drive an automobile at night, you have to wave a red lantern. During mm -hmm. the day, you have to wave a red flag for the purpose of alerting the horses so that they're not scared away by this giant making noise making automobile. And that, of course, you know, if you're going to buy a car and learn to drive, the last thing you want to do is hire another person to wave a red flag. So that's another example of obstructionist behavior, which is natural um, uh, against, um, you know, technology revolution. It's kind of the Luddite uh, response. Uh, maybe it's um, instinctive. Okay, well, I'm, I, but sometimes I hear sentences, and when you talked about the changing patterns of work, you know, well, there may be UBI, there may be more homeschooling, there may be a four-day work. <laughs> I sometimes hear these things and think, right, everyone needs to stop. Let's take the rest of the week off and just try and figure out how this is all going to work. That was one of those sentences. But as you were talking, there were two observations, one from Alex in and one from David Wood, that, that, that tackled two other big elements of this. One is the, the relationship between the Chinese state and the tech sector. And Alex Inch had a point about that. And, um, and David was looking at what kinds of work are going to be disruptive, whether, you know, creative, empathetic, et cetera. So I'm just going to bring Alex and David in to put their points to you and then ask you to, to respond. Alex, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, hi, Kaifu. I just had a, a brief thought that I picked up on when you mentioned um, Chinese self-driving cars, which I know that Didi are trying to really push that forwards now. And I just wondered how that squares with the current kind of Chinese government. They've got a very combative stance with a lot of big tech firms. And I wonder how likely they are to build infrastructure out to enable self-driving um, and help kind of further these companies' goals. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't think these are um, directly related. I think the um, Chinese government going after the internet giants is more about a competitive marketplace that's not dominated by a, a monopolistic leader. It's the same reason that EU and US go after the internet giants so in that capacity, Didi and Tencent and Alibaba and ByteDance are under some scrutiny. Um, I think the Chinese government is very pro-tech. So it very much wants autonomous vehicles to hit the road. It wants to lead in this um, uh, technological revolution. The fundamental reason why it's so important for China is that as it examines history in the last 200 years, it's very clear China missed the first and second industrial revolution. The winners were UK and US. The third in industrial revolution, namely PC and internet, China barely got in and got the sweet taste. And now we're in the fourth industrial revolution and China does not want to be left out. So promoting uh, technological advancement and self-sufficiency is at a very top priority. So, uh, so that's, I think, the orthogonal um, push that China will have. Uh, perhaps it would not be so consistent to have DD be the leader of an autonomous vehicle because that's a natural place for um, monopoly extension. So I'm, I'm not sure if that would be an issue, but certainly we fund uh, four autonomous vehicle companies and we're seeing a substantial adoption by cities. The cities are fighting for these autonomous vehicle companies to land. It's good that China has so many large cities and there's, there's so many autonomous vehicle companies to go around. So there's lots of experiments going around and I think people will learn from each other, cities will learn from each other, companies will learn from each other. Uh, we, uh, uh, one of our companies has a, a lot of buses that will be fully autonomous without steering wheel uh, are starting to operate already and produced in volume next year. So I think China is very much a believer that this, the government the government's role is to, to, 
to pay for expensive, very expensive infrastructure, infrastructure like 5G uh, data centers um, and, and, and infrastructure like smart highways and smart roads and, and, and subsidizing for uh, expensive buses that are robotic and autonomous to be uh, implemented first so that uh, technology can, can move forward on top of this um, infrastructure. In fact, China has approved um, a couple of months ago, as US was spending trillions to give to consumers, which is also valid, uh, China chose to spend 2 trillion US dollars in building what's called new infrastructure. And that is the combination of these smart city, smart road, um, um, uh, and uh, data centers and 5G. And, and, and kind of while we're on the subject, David, forgive me, <clears throat> just one second, while we're on the subject, but I, I preach out, appreciate Alex's point about the, the nature of the relationship and the change in relationship between the Chinese state and Chinese tech innovation and investment. F from the outside, it reads as though China and the Chinese government is seeking to do two things. One is to have a greater say over the social impact of technology. And the second is to have a stronger say in the conduct of those people who run technology companies, i.e. A, a more direct line into the management or the running of those companies. What will be, if you accept that premise, what would be the long-term impacts on the development of AI in China versus the US, given there are clearly different yeah. government cultures in each country? Um, well, so let's first dig at the root of the Chinese regulations. I think there are basically uh, two things at the root of the Chinese uh, regulations recently or messaging. I think mean, one clearly is um, uh, Chinese government wants the Chinese companies to be self-sufficient technologically, not to be over dependent on foreign technology because rug could be pulled out from under them as mm -hmm. uh, people saw in the Huawei case. And, and that means push for more AI, more self-sufficiency, more indigenous technologies. The second is really about reducing wealth inequality. Uh, the, uh, despite what you see about China's strength and power and wealth and large cities, still 55% of Chinese people make less than $160, uh, 160 US dollars a month. And, and I think the Chinese government very much understandably want to bring them uh, to a higher level of income to give them equivalent uh, in increasing equal opportunities. So it's going to potentially frown upon uh, things that um, are too much favoring the rich to get richer. And also it's going to like things that allow the balancing of the wealth inequality. So when you see uh, billions of dollars being donated by the likes of Alibaba and Tencent, uh, it is um, kind of an, an, an attempt to, to do the balancing. When you see educational companies under a bit of scrutiny, uh, that is because the education companies are actually uh, letting the rich people spend ten dollars or $20,000 per year per kid <clears throat> to essentially increase their SAT and GRE score by 400 points thereby uh, jumping ahead of the poor kid who finally has a chance. Now the rich kid pays for all these things. You know, mm -hmm. the reason that, you know, American and British kids don't, don't do that because it's because I don't think there is an expectation in a family that says, uh, if I am a middle or upper class uh, income parent and I can spend $20,000 and get you uh, to score 400 points higher on GRE, I will spend that money and you will study every night to do that. Yeah. China has that kind of culture. So, um, so the education companies, unfortunately, uh, unintentionally, but ends up creating a rich gets richer situation, which isn't uh, preferred. Well, there's, a, there's a whole debate. We had a really interesting conversation about meritocracy in the US with yes. a discussion about meritocracy to be had in China. But I saw right. a David Wood who, who was making a point about creativity and I suppose humanness, David. Um, do, do you want to respond to the conversation we were having a little earlier on on AI and the labor market? Absolutely. I'll start by echoing your comments from the beginning, James, that although there are many important public discussions going on just now, this particular public discussion might be even more important than most of the others. And it all depends on how much will AI be able to replace of what we humans do in the workforce. And we heard Kai Fu Lee in the beginning give a very interesting uh, case that 
many things that are currently routine can be uh, duplicated sooner or later by AIs, and this raises huge numbers of social challenges. Nevertheless, there will be other aspects of the human work involving things like creativity or compassion or empathy, which uh, will, for the foreseeable future, be outside the capability of AI. But that's what I want to push back on, because there are, after all, some companies such as a Affectiva and with Rana El Kalubi that's looking at emotional intelligence, the systems that can interact in a way that appears to be emotionally intelligent. There's a developments in the field of generative adversarial networks, GANs that are doing surprisingly creative things. And there's lots of innovations there. And there are other companies such as Jeff Hawkins, a Numenta company, Jeff Hawkins, who was a genius behind Palm Computing that some people may remember. He's been pursuing uh, neuroscience for a long time and he believes that he can copy elements of the human's brain's architecture into his AI systems, which will then allow a wider range of human activities. So what is your reason, uh, Kai-Fu, for uh, uh, saying, don't worry, by 2041, there will still be be plenty of human areas that AI can't reach because I see we will copy from the human brain and we will have AI, by the way, helping us to copy from the human brain. One generation of AI will help to piggyback the next one to make faster progress. Right. Uh, very good arguments. And let me divide into two parts. And of course, this represents my belief and which may or may not proven to be right. Uh, so the first is there are sort of two schools of thought. One is that the power of compute and data will keep pushing AI forward. And that's one school of thoughts. The other is that the marriage of uh, um, powerful compute AI uh, should be combined with a better understanding of our brain and brain sciences and in brain inspired sciences. And in combination, that will be the, uh, the revolutionary next step. So um, I'm more of a, a believer in the first camp. And if you're a believer in the first camp, then you know that AI is not really learning creativity, not really learning understanding, not really learning compassion, empathy, and um, um, teamwork and communications, but basically faking it and copying it. Um, and, and I think that will lead to systems that may look good enough to fool people in terms of visual, verbal, uh, to be very close to human. But when you look deeper, when you connect further, when you talk, it will make catastrophic errors, maybe one time out of 100. And that's what we see on things like GPT-3. Then people will say, oh my God, so horrible. I will not want to pretend to myself this is a human anymore. So people's bars are high and the errors are catastrophic. And we don't, it's a black box. So we don't know how to debug and fix it. So it seems like even 20 years ago, I would bet highly likely uh, those systems will emulate us better, but we'll still have periodic catastrophic errors. Uh, so that would not be acceptable, acceptable to humans. Furthermore, even if they emulated quite well, uh, there are many scenarios where people just prefer a human. Uh, for example, elderly care, an elderly person just isn't going to want a robot, even if a robot could have a good conversation and take a shower for him or her. So those are my reasons on the first class of um, algorithms, why they won't quite get to the full compassion, full creativity in 20 years. And they might in 40 years, they might in a longer period of time, 20 years, I think is quite unlikely. The other qu question is, People will come up with um, you know, brain computer interface, study brain sciences, try to understand how it is that humans manage to have self-awareness and emotion and love and compassion. And, and I'm afraid I think that, that there, there are two big issues. One is that uh, the brain sciences is at a very, very early stages. And the people in, working on this will uh, uh, acknowledge that they have a very long way to go. Very little is understood. Um, so that they, they could not give a time horizon by which brain sciences will get to a point where we can say, here are the bits in your brain that correspond to self-awareness uh, and here's how you can emulate it. They would be quite conservative at, 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 at this time. The second issue is uh, historically any effort to combine database methods and uh, sort of human-like thinking have not really led to a lot of success. Uh, one could say that deep learning is also neurally inspired. I think those are uh, okay if they're primarily computation, a little bit neural inspired, but adding them as two separate processes, we haven't yet seen much progress. 
Um, mm -hmm. and, and to be more blunt, we haven't seen any progress in non-deep learning based uh, technologies that would give us any hope for 20 years. So I'm just fundamentally pessimistic that the second approach would work at all in 20 years. Now, I have no basis to prove that they won't work, uh, but nor do the optimists have a basis to prove they would work. So I think we'll just have to see. David, thank you. And Kaisi, thank, thank you. I, I'm going to bring in Melanie uh, Denyu in a moment and my colleague Luke Bedema. I, I just want to, before I, Melanie, I'll just come to you. I just want to make sure we, we haven't really dug into the AI 2041, the book. And, and I know you've got the sort of 10 ideas, and I'm not going to sort of <laughs> ask you, Kaisi, to go through each of them. But the one thing that feels to me is true in the strand through the book is this idea that, look, AI has this potential to be transformative for good and bad. The question is, how do you build in systems that protect human lives and the quality mm -hmm. of human life, right? And I suppose that's the question I did want to put to you. We've talked a lot inside, taught us about seatbelts. You know, it took a long time from the invention of the car to get to the seatbelt. And it was, an, it was a requirement of industrial design, of government regulation, of consumer adoption. There are lots of moving parts. With AI, what I can't see is who's going to organize the, the introduction of the seat belts, because some of the impacts are going to be systemic rather than individual. And so I wondered how you think about that problem. Right. Um... I think there are several levels in which seatbelt equivalents can be introduced. One is just having a more systematic education where the AI engineers are not just taught how to code and use deep learning, but also understand that they, they have great power. They can impact people's lives and with great power comes great responsibility. So um, sort of um, uh, equivalent to the Hippocrates oath for doctors. I think that so I think more education is embracing that kind of uh, learning and training and discipline and uh, belief in ethics and understanding and also training and, and seeing examples where uh, the right um, approaches were not being adhered to what were the consequences. The second is um, a set of tools that could be built uh, just like compilers, right? When we write a code that is not tight or that has bugs, the compiler would warn us. They would either refuse to make a program or they would make the program, but, but let us know this is not a good program, not a safe program. And then similarly, when the, uh, uh, the, the next you know, version of TensorFlow uh, could check uh, whether your data is balanced, whether your training and data sets are being overfitted, et cetera. So good practices that can reduce the um, problems like uh, bias and uh, unfairness that might be addressable that way. Um, and, uh, can, and also we should advance the state in privacy computing so that we can potentially have our cake and eat it too. That is AI can train on large amounts of data without actually having one company see everybody's data, but have data stored in places to which uh, the person uh, licenses. So I think those are some, some, some of the steps Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I think there are non-technological solutions. Um, I, I like um, the idea of an AI audit. Uh, you know, we can't check on everybody. It's like the financial audit or the tax audit. You check on 0.1% of the people. And then um, because there, there are uh, reasons to, to doubt that they're being responsible, maybe based on, uh, uh, com maybe based on complaints or maybe based on violations. And also, I think... Uh, there, there can be um, scoreboards or uh, uh, ESG type approaches where companies are being rated on, uh, let's say a social network being rated on wh whether they do a good job on, on fake news or uh, on deep fakes. And uh, you know, they're all complaining, you can't tell for sure, but we can score them probabilistically. So just like we can score reading comprehension uh, ratings, we can score what percentage, how well you're doing on fake news. And then those numbers, if they start to uh, basically cause the companies to lose um, uh, brand and become shamed or be when they're ranked last, or maybe when they don't pass ESG, they can't pass corporate governance and can't, can get investment from some um, uh, inv ethically driven investing funds, then those can cause better behavior. 
So I think those are the things that uh, in the book I talk about and hypothesize and integrate into some of the stories. Um, Catherine, thank you. I, I mentioned I'm going to bring in Melanie uh, Daniel. Mel Melanie, are you there? You look like you're either on Mars or on teetering on the side of the... North okay. Yorkshire, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could just as well be Mars in some places. It's that kind of bleaker landscape, but beautiful. <laughs> Barely. So, so you, you were going to weigh in on this, the human element and the human scoring of AI, yeah. Yes, absolutely, because I think a lot of what we're hearing here is things will self-regulate and maybe, you know, the companies can be encouraged and maybe we can do an audit and maybe there will be signals to suggest that they're not necessarily doing things right. And I think part of the problem with that is that, number one, transparency. There's not very much of it. And if you're relying upon a company that has a commercial gain to be made in to actually be transparent and talk about what they're doing and the impact that it could have, well, good luck with that. It's yeah. not going to happen. We've already seen with Cambridge Analytica, they didn't come clean until they were forced to. And that's a really great example of how it can go very wrong. But then there are less cynical examples of where things go wrong. Over the last two years, even, I think we can talk about a number of examples, even Yann LeCun from Facebook, who is an acknowledged AI expert, cocked it up completely with a facial recognition package because they had training data that was too heavily based around white males so that when they reconstituted the faces, they actually turned Barack Obama more or less white, except for the color of his skin. That's one example. There's been countless similar things where essentially best intentions, but because you don't have the right people at the room designing the project at the start, who are thinking about how you can actually mitigate things, there aren't people there that perhaps should be represented. There is not this assurance and there is no compunction on any company to do that. So- Melanie, well, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to respond, sorry. <laughs> but I'm also gonna ask you then to, to, to say what you think is the best, best answer to this set of problems, Kaifu. Uh, no, I agree with that. I think uh, diversity is important. You know, my alma mater, Carnegie Mellon, now has 50-50% uh, women and men incoming class. And I think efforts like that, all of these will each do a little bit um, in, in that direction. Uh, one other idea I have that I talked about in the book, I'll, I'll, I'll describe it, is really, I think the issue, as you mentioned, is that the companies have a different uh, economic incentive and their interests are misaligned with ours. Uh, they want to, to more clicks and more views and more revenue. And then they trick us into clicking and watching and buying uh, because they know what we like. And we end up not getting what we want, but giving them what they want mm -hmm. uh, at our expense sometimes. So that I think is the fundamental issue. And, and I think the only way to really address that is to find business models that are more aligned for the um, technology provider or the app and the, the customers. So one example that I think uh, fits better, maybe not perfect, but fits a lot better is uh, Netflix. A uh, Netflix model of using subscription to fund the content that wins the long-term trust of the user so as to pay more, more annual um, subscription fee compared to a Facebook that is showing us things to get instant gratification with our Pavlovian clicks um, is, is, is an advertising based model. So I think those of us in investing and in entrepreneurial should think about what are some natural capitalistic mechanisms to prefer, um, uh, to prefer business models that will tend to create an alignment of interests between the user and the businesses as opposed to the ones that create the temptation that's just too hard to resist for the business owner to keep uh, dangling in front of us for us to click. Well, Melanie, what's your, uh, what's your answer to this? Uh, you, you raise I suppose it. there's various things. I mean, I've considered, do you look at things in terms of legally? Well, no government is actually wanting at this point to really impose laws, not least because a lot of the time they don't have the expertise to do it, but also because the law is quite a blunt instrument, the technology is fast moving, and it's very hard to keep up with it because you can only legislate for what is rather mm. than what may be at any given time. Governance by voluntary body or statutory body, probably there is a role for that, 
But I think actually using that in conjunction with a new role of something like AI ethicist may well be where we have to go so that you have independent arbiters who are trained, who understand the technology, who do see the implications and can actually be hired in by companies from the start of a project to help them consider the things that in their enthusiasm, particularly in startup cultures, yes. that it's so desperate that they need to get these people with their perspective to help them not suffer unintended consequences and more importantly the world suffer unintended consequences you know i mentioned in the chat public intelligence which is much more about protecting jobs but yes a lot of what they're thinking about is how do we actually safeguard human jobs and things like that until the mechanisms that society can bring are in place like ubi it's all part of a continuum there and i think and by the way i think that the reason why we created this ai index and the ai network and the reason we are really keen to have conversations like this and conversations with people like you, Kai Fu, is, the, is the honest truth is that it feels as though our politics is still very much second, third industrial revolution, not fourth. It really feels as though we are understanding how you prosecute bad actors that behave badly with individuals, but we really mm -hmm. struggle to understand what happens mm -hmm. when new industries create system-wide changes in society that you can't necessarily intervene with a one company and you can't necessarily see its aggregate impacts. And that, that's what we're trying to work out. I, I'm going to bring in, the, the person who's much better at this than me is my colleague, Luke Bedimer, who, who writes our tech state sense maker. L Luke, the thing that's really interesting when I read what you write is the extent to which the tech companies that I grew up with that seemed as though they were much more, we talked about them as platforms, are obviously in an AI race of their own. And I wonder how you see things, and, and particularly given Kaifu's investments in AI in China, you know, what you think of all this? Well, um, I've got a, a couple of notes on the side that have drawn out from the conversation, and hopefully people will be able to read about them tomorrow when we actually put out, Alexi and I put out the edition of Tech States. But the first thing was about legacy products and processes and then products and processes that could emerge in the future. And it's basically to echo the, the point that Melanie's just made about how regulators can address what's happening now versus what's happening in the future. Um, I did some interviews with people about the online safety bill, which um, the UK is trying to move forward with and is supposedly going to make the UK the safest place on, in the world to be online. Um, people close to that matter are not confident at all that the changes <laughs> will make the UK the safest place in the world to be online. And, and previous efforts in Australia and other parts of the world to, to do that have been um, very tricky. And the question you asked James about the, the race, um, the race to advance in, in AI specific systems when it comes to Facebook and Google and Microsoft and the companies that we look at really comes down to the, the, the question of their incentives. And that's, I think what um, Kai Fu and Melanie were talking about, it's very clear to us when we do this reporting that their incentives are not aligned with, uh, with, with the, the people who use their platforms. Well, well let, me, let me, I'm just gonna ask Peter Ward to weigh in too before I go back to you, Kaifu, because I see the time is drawn to a close. But, but Peter, you just made a really interesting point in the chat about this not being AI specific, but just AI amplified. Do, do, you, do you want to articulate that? And I'll ask Kaifu to respond. Well, I, I was I was struck with the, the the discussion that Melanie kicked off, where we're talking about a whole load of issues. Which, frankly, if you took it out of the AI environment, we'd be having the same conversation about the basic ethics of of business and the way that decisions are made. You know, we we you talked uh, uh, Kaifu, you talked about ES, ESG. Well, quite often that's just a tick box. Mm. It's not a it's. It doesn't impact on the decision making. It impacts on the disclosure of the decisions that have been made. Yes. You know what I mean? So I, I do think I do think it's it's time for us to to as a, as a privileged group of people who tend to lead or advise uh, organisations and nations and whatever, or we're in the media or whatever. It's time for us to actually wake up and start to start to adjust our behaviours so that we can cope with these fantastic developments. Peter, thank you. Kai, will you respond to that? Incentive, the alignment of incentives and social <clears throat> goods, the, the extent to which we do fundamentally change the way in which businesses and politics uh, behave. Will you respond to the comments from Luke and Peter? 
Sure, I, I agree that AI is an accelerator, but it is an exponential accelerator given how fast it's growing and that it's growing just by throwing more data at it. So, uh, and, and I also think the fundamental issue as all of us have brought up is that uh, the, the incentives are not aligned. So, you know, in, in the ideas that all of us have brought about, you know, the, the ways to align the incentives are either to create punitive uh, disincentives that if you don't do this, uh, you're going to uh, be violating some regulations. That if you don't do this, you're going to get dinged on ESG and don't have investment. If you don't do this, you'll get audited. So I think that's kind of one class of things to consider. But in terms of the incentives, uh, it would be great if there were some positive examples that are AI Netflix-like that says, wow, these people build an app that I would really want to use because uh, by using this social network, I get to become smarter, more well-liked, and happier. And because it's optimizing long, my long-term goals, I really would like to see us move to that. Of course, that's a bit aspirational and futuristic, but in one of the stories in AI 2041, uh, we do talk about that. Uh, so, so I think basically there are ways to, uh, you know, we humans, uh, I think we know what we want, but um, the companies, um, the, there are ways to shift them towards being aligned with us, either by punishing them for when they behave poorly or by encouraging and rewarding them when they behave well. So these are, I think, are the, are the tools that we have. And, and last thing I would say is, you know, you guys publish an uh, AI uh, index and, and maybe think about, can you also extend that to becoming a, a scoreboard for social media or for internet companies? Mm -hmm. Can we measure them on the degree to which they violate uh, um, uh, discriminatory behavior, fair and biased, biased issues, data, personal data violations, deep fakes and fake news? If there are some such methods and those become the gold standard, then, then that would be the punitive side uh, that would cause them to at least um, you know, uh, work to reach a minimal, minimum acceptable standard, not to reach a... Uh, not to have an egregious or terrible um, incident. Kaifu, thank you. I, I see that we are we're at the end of our time. It's one of those moments where you think, well, now we're just getting going. What are we doing stopping? We're only just getting into some of the more difficult subjects here. But we will take away those things. I will say my colleague, um, my co-founder, Katie Vanek-Smith, said, look, we'd love to have you back when we talk about education, because it feels as though there's a whole debate to be had that's not actually about quantum or computing or AI. It's actually about the education systems we need now. Um, Alexandra Musavizade, I saw nodding away, as you said, you know, what would be the next strand to the AI index that would deal with some of these adverse impacts? We'll certainly think about that. I want to say a massive thank you just personally for helping disentangle sort of China's AI, US AI, and the impact on the way in which our, our work and our economy might be impacted by all of that. And thank you for managing somehow, rather miraculously, to get us to 2041 in a way that gives us just the right mix of fear and hope. Um, I suppose it is ultimately in our hands what we do uh, with these technologies. So Kaifu, thank you for your time. Have a very good evening in Beijing. And for everyone joining you. wherever you are, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.